Hey, Life Church, my name is Lane Schranz. I'm a pastor at Church of the Highlands in the deep south in Birmingham, Alabama, and I just wanna say how excited I am for this amazing transition from Pastor David to Pastor Josh. I love this family so much. I love the Life Church family. As often as I've been able to be there with you guys, I just think you're a part of amazing work of God and something special that the Holy Spirit has been doing for years. So I wanna honor Pastor David and Joanne for pioneering this great church and for their years of hard work and dedication. A lot of tears, a lot of prayers prayed that none of us were able to see, but they have poured their lives into this church and to see the the beautiful thing of a of a son then uh, taking the lead with pastor josh and Brittany, i am so fired up about this i know that this is god's timing for life church i know this is uh, part of his plan and i couldn't be more excited uh, for pastor josh and Brittany as they uh, take the lead there and just wanted to say congratulations to them congratulations to the church and want you guys to know that I love you and I'm praying for you. And Pastor Josh, you were made for this, for such a time as this. I believe the Life Church, their best days are ahead. So uh, way to go, church. Uh, continue to reach people for Jesus. Continue to keep your focus on him as Pastor uh, Josh takes the lead there. And I know great things are ahead. We want to honor Pastor David and Joanne, who for years have faithfully laid the groundwork for this incredible environment and culture within your church and the people. You guys are just beautiful people, and you have followed and um, just become that missional body, that community that um, can really reach your whole area, and you're doing it. And we just applaud you, and we're thankful for their leadership and how they have laid that foundation in you. Absolutely. Pastor David and Joanne, I hold you in the, the highest regard and I love you so much. And now we're excited to celebrate the passing of this responsibility of leadership to Pastor Josh and Brittany. Our prayers will be with you. You are absolutely the persons to step into this role and lead into the future. And as God said to Joshua, in the book of Joshua we have the amazing story that when that baton of leadership passed to him, it was years, seven years to be exact. Basically, every battle was won. Uh, 25,000 square miles of property was possessed. It was a time of incredible success. I think the shoulders of leadership and sacrifice that you are standing on have positioned you like Joshua in the Old Testament, to get the victory on every place where you step. May it be the highest and the best. We will be praying for you, cheering you on every step of the way. God bless you, Life Church. God bless you on this day of transition. Hi, this is Al Fury, commonly known as Pastor Al, speaking to you from Camino de Vida Church in Lima, Peru. This is a momentous and historic occasion where Pastor David and Joanne are handing over the role of leadership of Life Church to their eldest son, Josh, and his wonderful wife, Brittany. Kathy and I have known David and Joanne for in excess of 20 years. We've walked with them, we've talked with them, we've laughed with them, we've cried with them, and we've seen them grow this remarkable church. And I want to say to the church right now, this is not the end of Pastor David and Joanne. Prophetically, I am speaking that God has a plan to take them on to greater and bigger and more momentous things. For Josh and Brittany, I want to say this to you. God spoke to me during this week as I was waiting to do this, that God is going to bless you abundantly. God's going to take you beyond what you've ever imagined or seen. And this church will continue to grow until it will be one of the biggest churches in the nation. Please understand, church, when the pattern is passed on, it is not the end. It is the beginning of a new season of growth and love and pastoralship. We love you. We appreciate you. And God bless you, Josh and Brittany, in this wonderful, wonderful time. 
we're believing God with you that this is the brand new beginning for an incredible season for you, for your family, and most importantly, for the church there. We believe God's hands on you as they're installing you, putting you in place, putting that mantle on you. We're praying for you. We're believing that the anointing of God is going to be stronger on you than it's ever been before, that God breathed fresh vision, fresh life into your heart, into the heart of the church. Just know we're standing with you. Anything we can do, we're for you, we're with you all the way. Your best days are in front of you. Well, greetings from Arizona, where the weather today is around about 70 degrees. Sorry, total accident, didn't mean to include that in this video. I wanted to take the moment out on behalf of Anna and myself and our family to congratulate Pastor Josh and Brittany on being prayed in today as the new lead pastors of the Life Church. A big shout out to Pastor David and Joanne as you pass the baton on today and these become your years of significance. We've been doing this journey with you now for around about 18 years and we look forward to the years ahead, believing for great things in the life of the Life Church. To all the team, all the volunteers, and you know, all the people that call Life Church home, this is gonna be a significant and incredible season. We're excited, do life together. Wish I could be with you today, but praying for you anyway. God bless you, much love to you all. We're so excited about this new day that has come to your congregation. You know, a few months ago, we were able to be with you and I could already sense that God was about to do something fresh, something new, shifting your church into a time of great favor. And all of the things that you have gone through and developed and all of the ministries that has been going on for 20 years are about to take on a new expanded life. I'm so thankful for our founders. Uh, Pastor David and Joanne are dear friends to us and it's very important, I often tell people, if you don't understand your history, you'll never be able to walk in your destiny. If you don't know the past and how it got you here, you won't understand the process to your destiny. So one of the greatest things that you can do is embrace, celebrate, and thank God for how you got from there to here. And now it's a new day, it's a new season. I remember being with the staff and feeling the Lord say to me that this was going to be a church that would reach out for those that had not really experienced justice that this church would be there for those who have maybe been shamed by past experiences, that you would be stepping up and you would be saying to the community, come, we'll minister healing to you. We'll be there for you when maybe no one else will be. This is your mantle. This is a time when our culture is so imploding on itself with pain that now Life Church comes. And I just speak over Pastor Josh and Brittany that there is going to be a new mantle. It is significant when you do an installation service. God does remember moments, moments of conversion, moments of baptism, moments of ordination, and moments of transferring into the next generation. And so today, is a new day, not just for the Baird family, but for all of you. Because as the church steps into a new destiny, grab a hold of this mantle, grab a hold of this season, and take your destiny, your legacy, and let's move forward. Josh, Brittany, and all 17 of your kids, this is John Gray moving to my next destination. This video is purposed because I didn't want it to be cute and polished because ministry is not cute nor polished. You have to keep moving. And you were faithful in your last assignment. Now God has elevated you. I remember coming to a red barn, meeting you. And I saw then what I see now, the touch of God, the hand of God. And now I see a new grace on you to lead, to take what your mom and dad started and now take it to an entirely new place. 
You are well equipped for this moment. You and Brittany are well able to handle it. The weight of responsibility will be directly proportional to the weight of glory that's on your life. I love you both. Congratulations. And by all means, keep moving forward. Don't stop. Keep going. I love you, man. I'm proud of you, pastor, senior pastor. God bless you and God bless you, Life Church. I love y'all. See you soon. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, we are overwhelmed with your response tonight in being here. It means a lot to Joanne and I, and I know it means a lot to Josh and Brittany, as Alfieri would say. <laughs> and um, the most special people in the room tonight would be our Life Church family. Those of you that were in the beginning, those of you that have come since, and all of us who are here together tonight. So I think we need to give the, the bigger applause for the Life Church family that's here. I also want to um, recognize all of our guests who've come. We decided not to invite the guests from afar uh, because we wanted this night to be more intimate. But obviously we've heard from a lot of our friends on video and we've got one more at the end. But um, we've got pastors from our community, pastors from the region. I think about like Dennis Pisani came over from D.C. He's been such a, a great support for Joanne and I, he and Donna. But I, and, and there are other pastors here, and I'm not going to try to call all of your names. You know that I am thrilled that you came and sacrificed on this Sunday night. But, but I do want, for a particular reason, to introduce one couple. Uh, actually, this couple uh, took over for his father also. And they just happened to be one of the closest churches to the Life Church in proximity. And um, a lot of people came from their church to our church. And then a lot of people have gone from our church to their church. You, actually, if you just stay where you start, you'll probably be okay once everything is said and done. But uh, it just so happened that this past year, Josh was coaching Rayleigh's football team. And, I mean, yeah, Romans, not Rayleigh's. Romans, i got to get it right. But Pastor Luby's daughter was actually on the team and by far the best player on the team. And it's, isn't it interesting how in the kingdom God can end up bringing, he can even use a football, a peewee football team to bring two pastors together. So just to show that, I'll tell you, at the end of the day, we are united as one church in this region. I wanted Gavin and Sarah just to stand from live, the pastors of living faith. We want to recognize you and... Thank you for being here tonight. When, whenever people come to your church, pastors think that's... When, when, when somebody joins your church, a pastor automatically thinks that's the will of God. When, when, a, past, when, a, when a family leaves your church, the pastor automatically thinks that's the devil. Reminds me of a story when I was growing up. I've told it many times. My home church was putting an addition on, and they didn't have the money to hire contractors, so they did all the work themselves. And I was looking out the window one day, and a guy, a volunteer, was driving a bulldozer, and he rammed the bulldozer into the side of the new wall that had just gone up, and the wall came tumbling down. And I went running over there. We live right next to the church. And you had one group huddled over here saying, God did this. He didn't want us to grow. Then you had another group over here. The devil did this. He's trying to stop the growth. And I got my first prophetic word. It wasn't God. It wasn't the devil. It was the dummy driving the bulldozer. That's, that's who knocked the wall down. So, uh, you know, in church life, uh, my, my dad always taught me this. He said, be faithful when it's going great, but be just as faithful when it's not going great. 
Because at the end of the day, it'll all come around. So um, I, I'm just so glad that the kingdom of God is bigger than the Life Church. Uh, and I'm glad there are great churches in our region that are working hard to see God's kingdom established. And uh, to all of all the churches represented, I saw Jonathan and Audrea come in. They, they've planted a church in D.C. That's not an easy task. I just ask Dennis. He'll tell you. But um, they're working hard there. And at the end of the day, it's not the size. Joanne and I had just as much fun when we had 100 people in our first year as we had the, actually, we had more fun that year than we've had this year. But um, uh, th that first year, we, we were the only church in America that crossed the 100 barrier twice. We started with more than 100, lost our whole worship team in one day, went below 100, and by the end of the year, we had come back up over 100. So uh, I'm telling you, the, the important thing is to obey God and do what God has called you to do. On the day of Pentecost, maybe the most overlooked verse was when Peter said, this promise is to you, to your children, and to all those who are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. How many know God does his best work generationally? God's best work is generational, and it's through family succession. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob. So you can be on the, the, the third end of the three generations, but then you become the first for a new one. So Jacob was the third generation, but then it was Jacob, Joseph, and Ephraim. And you may not know as much about Ephraim as you do the other boys uh, in, the, uh, genealogy, in the generational succession, but the truth of the matter is Ephraim and Manasseh are key because they were the first children of Israel born in Egypt. And yet they remained faithful to the covenant and allowed the way later for, obviously, Moses to rise up as the great deliverer. So every generation is important. And God does his best work when we generationally uh, cooperate with him. In fact, the significance of God's work is always found in the third generation. I stand here tonight as a product, a second-generation product. 1930, 17-year-old girl in Petersburg, Virginia, in central Virginia, was hungry for more of God. She went to her Baptist church, but she was hungry for something she didn't know what she was looking for. And a tent meeting revival came to town. It was the early days of the Pentecostal movement, and my mother walked by herself to this tent meeting revival and was gloriously converted and gloriously baptized in the Holy Spirit. And it turned out that in 1930, that revival went all summer, and she would go every uh, night. And back then, if you were baptized in the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues, you were maligned. And, and people would make fun of her as she would walk and, and go to that tent meeting. But out of that came a, a call of God. As she ended up going to a faith Bible school in Rhode Island, went into ministry, came back, served her local church. And then when nobody, when no man would go, this was before the day of the woman preacher, but when no man would go, her pastor asked her to go way down to a remote area in southern Virginia and, and just start preaching the gospel because people were hungry for more. And she and a co-worker went, and hundreds and hundreds of people in the 1940s were saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit, and six churches were planted in southern Virginia. just so happened that I was born into one of them. 
My dad had come back from serving in the armed for in World War II, and he was a, a merchant. Uh, he had a country store. This is Boondock. Sean will tell you. Uh, my nephew, Sean. Um, you know, and, and um, he met my mother. And the rest is history. They got married, and uh, I'm actually glad they did. Her co-worker got real jealous, said you can serve God better if you never get married. But thank God she didn't listen to uh, her co-worker, who probably wanted a husband but couldn't get one. No, I'm just joking. I shouldn't say that. Um, you know how we spiritualize everything. I'm second generation. I think about if my mom hadn't gone to that tent meeting, there might not be a life church today. Then I think about Joanne's grandmother. I robbed the cradle. I'm, I'm second generation. She's third. So it's nice when the second generation guy can marry the third generation girl. But her grandmother, who's along with my mother, are in heaven tonight. Um, Ressy was a young lady, a mother. Not serving God. I can't, she was, Grandma Utz was so holy, I can't even hardly tell this story without feeling convicted. But this was prior to, this was BC, this was before Christ. It was November 1953. She was married, raising kids under a lot of stress, as she tells it. And she and three of her co workers on a Thursday afternoon, were plotting how they were going to go out that weekend, get drunk, and actually probably have an affair, each of them, on their husband because they weren't satisfied in their marriage. She gets out of a car after they had made their plans for a Friday night. It was on a Thursday night, and all of a sudden a black cloud showed up. And all of a sudden the Holy Spirit hovered over her. She didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit and said, you're not going to do that. The next night... She, her, her husband, who was not a, 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 you know, a born-again Christian at the time, said, there's somebody that wants uh, us to drive them to this revival. And this was in Rappahannock County, Virginia. And so uh, some of you are from Rappahannock County. I think Josh even lives in Rappahannock County. God forbid place, or wherever that's at out there, you know. And that next night she rode along with her husband. And, and, and she got scared out of sinning that weekend. The, the judgment of God was so strong on her, she ended up riding with her husband, going into that church, and when an altar call was given, she said, I don't know what came over me, but I went running down to the front and gave my heart to Jesus, and she started a trend in her generation. Uh, she would never go into full-time ministry, but she was as much of a minister as anyone I've ever known. So when I stand before you tonight, I don't stand here on my own. I stand here second, and even in Joanne's case, third generation. 1999, Josh was 12, Jordan was 8, Justin was 4. Um, backing up a bit, I'd started in ministry when I was 17. Started preaching in a barn, and God put me in a barn in Prince William County years later. Southern Virginia, preaching in a barn. Ended up preaching for like 11 years. Then I married Joanne, and we started pastoring what would be the seed of the life church in 1985. I was 28 years old at the time. Um, years later, some 14 years later, 1999, God spoke clearly to us that we were to plant a church that was not religious, a church that would focus on the hurting and the broken, and most of all, a church that our sons would want to go to, and that one day they would want to take ownership of. And so 20 years later, on this January 27th, we have succession. Success is always found in succession. 
You can't say the word succession without seeing success. How many know the third generation is always more fulfilling, more significant, more productive? And I'm happy to report tonight that Josh and Britt do not have to start over. See, somebody said, well, what's going to happen to your vision? My vision's just going to get more fulfilled. And really, it's not mine anyway. It's his. Any vision worth having is a heavenly vision. And I believe that's why a principle in the Bible, and I just want to touch on this for a moment, because sometimes as we get older, we get bitter because we feel like life has passed us by. I told Josh, I promise not to be like John the Baptist. Let me just inject this. When, when he's, how many know John was the first one that was born? He was born before Jesus. He was in the plan of redemption, in the Christmas story. And, and he baptized Jesus. And, and, and how many know, he said, there's one that's going to come greater than me, that's going to come after me. And how many know the, the great infamous statement? He said, look, I'm going to decrease so he can increase. How many, that's not a negative. How many know, that's awesome. John gave way to Jesus. But by the time John finished his ministry and was in prison, he had become embittered. And you know what he was asking? Should we look for another? I told Josh, I will not. He can hold me to it. He'll be my pastor. I will not end up somewhere bitter saying, shall we look for another? Because the principle of the kingdom is that the older will serve the younger. The natural order says the younger serve the older. But how many know that got reversed with Jacob and Esau? And God established something at their birth that reverse things and said, it's not going to be the younger serving the older, but the young, older are going to serve the younger. You know why? Because the younger can run faster. It doesn't mean there's no place for the older. But how many know the, the second covenant was better than the first? The second Adam was better than the first. And it should always get better. That's why I, I don't want to get old and bitter. I want to be old and part of something that's better, something that's flourishing, something that is going further, faster for the kingdom of God. And so that's why tonight I have the highest honor. Let me just say this. Sons, and I'm not excluding daughters, but... I didn't raise any daughters, so if all of you that have daughters, just figure it out. Um, I do have granddaughters. Um, but sons honor fathers. But how many know fathers honor sons? And the greatest honor a father can ever have on a son is when he honors his son as a father. I remember my dad, who's in heaven now, visiting us. We were living in Haymarket, and we, we weren't far along. I mean, we, I, think, I think it was the week that Justin was born, and we didn't know if he was going to live or not. And my dad said something to me that I never forgot, and even the day I got the call that he had suddenly died and gone to heaven. He said, I am proud of you, son, because I see the way you are fathering your son. Never was there a prouder moment for this son. And I'm telling you, the highest honor a father can bestow upon a son is honoring the son as a father. Joanne and I have loved our days of serving this church. It has been a joy ride. People say, oh, you've been through tough times. Yes, we have, but I'm telling you. I've loved it. I've never gotten up on a Sunday and not want to, wanted to preach. I don't know what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. I'll be in therapy, I promise you. But tonight it gives me great honor to pass on to a third generation what was passed on to me. 
So I'm going to ask my wife to come, Joanne, and all of y'all know if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't have made it this far. But I want you to help me honor my son and daughter-in-law as they come to become your pastors tonight. Let's welcome Josh and Brittany as they come. can be seated. Josh, before I charge you and Britt to take responsibility of this church, uh, I've got a a couple gifts I want to give you. Um, First of all, this was my mother's last preaching Bible. It wasn't her last Bible because she lived many years after she stopped preaching. But uh, she wrote the cost of the Bible in the Bible. She was just that way. (laughs) But this Bible she got October 17th, 1960. And uh, it's far more used than any Bible I ever used. But Josh, I want you to have this representing the first generation. And then, um, this was my first preaching Bible. And yes, it was King James Version. And this was given to me in 1974 by my mother. Christmas 74. It was the first year I started preaching in the barn. Now, my my mother, Cheryl, my sister-in-law knows this. She had this habit when she gave people anything, she put pictures in it, and she would put scotch tape over the pictures. So she's got a picture of me, high school graduation. I look horrible. I don't want to show this. This is terrible. But see, thank God she scotch taped it. But there it is from 1974. And Josh, this was my first. You, you've done a lot of preaching already, but this was my first preaching Bible. So tonight, counting the one you have, you now have three generations of preaching Bibles. So uh, Congratulations. Josh and Britt, I want to charge you as you take this responsibility, and I'll read this. I'm not going to get too formal here, but I charge you before God to preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove Rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist. You better do that. Make full proof of your ministry. Study to show yourself approved to God. A workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Be an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Meditate upon these things. Give yourself wholly to them. Always take heed to yourself and unto the doctrine that comes from God. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and those that hear you. Be gentle unto all men. Apt to teach, be patient in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. And I'll inject this. Always remember Galatians 6.1. When you're restoring those who have fallen, do so in the spirit of meekness and gentleness, considering yourself. 
Be gentle to all men. Follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold onto eternal life. Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that wars entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be the soldier. Give no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed. Always take heed to yourself and to the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you an overseer. Feed the church of God, which he purchased with his blood. Take the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre. Some of you don't even know what that means, but not for earthly gain, but of a ready mind. Do not be Lord over God's heritage, but be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you will receive a crown of glory that fades not away. You are to preach the word not the opinions and traditions of men, not pleasing fables or sensational stories to move the fancy or excite the emotions. You are not to exalt yourself, but as in the presence of God, you are to stand before a dying world and preach the word. Let there be no levity, no thrilling, no fanciful interpretation. As a minister of God, you are to speak with sincerity and deep earnestness. As a voice from God, expounding the Holy Scriptures. You are to bring to your hearers those things which most concern their present and their eternal good. Your whole aim should be to bring sinners to repentance, pointing them to the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You should speak as one conscious of the power and authority from God. Your discourses should have an earnestness, a fervor, a power of persuasion that will lead sinners to take refuge in Christ. Always let the grace of God be the driving force of your teaching, of your decisions, of your disciplining, so as to be a scandal of grace for the religious, but a thriving hope for those who have been shamed and rejected by the religious community. Never allow the body of believers to become proud, self-righteous, or religious in appearance, but only a revelation of the righteousness of God procured by Jesus' death on the cross. Maintain the life church, Not as a museum for the religious, but as a hospital for the hurting and the broken. Give yourself to the people nobody wants, and God will give you the people everybody wants. Love people, but never let people lead you. Proclaim in word and deed the now presence of the kingdom of God. Not as a future dream, but as a present reality. This is my charge to you. And Josh and Britt, I would ask you tonight, do you accept this mantle to lead God's people and to oversee the life church? Amen. I want you to stay standing. And Josh and I chose, I chose one and Josh chose one uh, to come and to pray the installation prayer over Josh and Britt. First of all, I asked my pastor and his wife, uh, Wally Odom and Gwen, Wally's dad married Joanne and I. And to show you something generationally, his dad, well, actually, his dad was a second-generation preacher, but to me, he was first. Wally was second, and now I've got Suzanne, who's third generation. So um, I asked Wally to come and pray, and then Josh invited another Josh, Pastor Josh and Crystal Whitlow from uh, Heights Church in Richmond, Virginia. They planted the church a few years ago. It's like one of the fastest growing churches in Virginia. And I'm happy to announce that Josh Whitlow is going to be on Josh's overseer board. So I'm going to ask Josh. Oh, there you are, Josh and Crystal. So I'm going to pass the mic first to Wally and then to Josh. And I want all of you, as they pray, to put your hand forward in 
solidarity with these. First of all, I want to say how much I appreciate you, Pastor David and Joanne. We've walked together, we've fought together, battles against the enemy, and we've laughed together, and we've enjoyed each other's company. I've stayed at your house more than you stayed at mine. And, uh, and, and, I, I, and I'm just so proud of what you guys are doing. I, I, I honor you, I honor you. And Josh and Brittany, this really isn't unusual for me because you've been my pastor for almost three years now. <laughs> and I think I'm growing. <laughs> I know more than I did three years ago. I'm doing better than I was doing three years ago. I love you guys. So, Brittany, I, I, prayed, I prayed for both of you, and I just, Brittany, I want to say this to you, that you're like, you're like, Josh is like a rushing river. You know, he, he moves fast. You're the boundaries that God's placed around him. You're the riverbanks. And he can run wildly because you're there for him. You have a sharp sense of right and wrong, black and white, and, uh, but with compassion and with, with a, a soft heart. Some people get a hard heart when they get like that, not you, Brittany. You, have, you love people, and I am delighted to call you my pastor's wife. I really am. <clears throat> And Josh, before I pray for you, I've, I've prayed for you a lot. Isn't, isn't dropping the mic some kind of symbol? <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> so I was, I was praying for, I, I pray for you a lot. I, you know, you're my pastor and I pray for you and I prayed for David and I pray for my church. And Honestly, what I, I'd go to pray for you, I try to get something real spiritual, and, and all I got was football. <laughs> and and so, I'm going. Why would I get that? And and the Lord really spoke to me that He's been training you all of your life, and that He trains us in different ways. I didn't go through football. I went through a bunch of school. God, God put you. And in, in, in football, you've learned two things that I've watched you exercise masterfully as a pastor. God gave you a sense of the power of preparation because you don't get on the field until you're prepared. He gave you a, a, he gave you a, a strong sense of, of teamwork. You never win a game by yourself. And you've brought that into the ministry. And, uh, and while I was praying for you, two other words. One was God said it's safe for me to follow you because you follow him. That's huge for me. <clears throat> and the other, the other thing, right before I left to come over here tonight, God put a verse on my heart, and I, it hadn't been on, I hadn't thought of it for years, but it was Psalm 92.10. I've been anointed with fresh oil. You're stepping into responsibilities that are greater than the ones you've had. In ministry, that's a larger platform that you've had, and it's going to get increasingly larger, and you need fresh oil. And God said, I have for Josh and for Brittany fresh oil. Not last year's oil, not 20 years ago oil, but God's got fresh oil for you tonight. I love you guys. Would you join me in prayer? Father, I thank you for Josh, and I thank you for Brittany, and I thank you. It's an honor to call them my pastor. I thank you for what you've done for them. I thank you for what you're doing for my family through them. I've watched them be a blessing in my own household, and God, I'm so grateful. I'm grateful that I get to hear his sermons and, and not somebody else's sermons because I just love his preaching. And I love the fact that he's teaching me and he's training me. And I might be an old dog, but I'm learning new tricks. And God, I thank you for Josh. And I just pray fresh anointing, fresh oil from heaven. I pray that you will anoint them with fresh oil. Tomorrow when they wake up, may they wake up with a sense that something is different, something is large, something is new, something is fresh. And God, we pray that they will be more than a match for everything that our church faces as it grows. And we bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I love you guys.
special. I love having you. Well, come on, good evening, uh, Pastor uh, David and Joanne. I just, I just wanted to first start off by saying um, we come from a family that's been in the ministry to all of our life and generational, and Chris and I were just sitting right there on the front row and with four young kids that we're trying to raise. I just couldn't help but think over and over again, man, what, an, what an example that this family is, that this church is, and I just kept, man, Lord, help us to do it. And man, what you guys have done, not just us, not just Heights Church, but churches all across America, there's a generation of people that are standing on you guys' shoulders. And man, we just thank you and we honor you. Your impact has impacted the city of Richmond. It's impacted our church and other churches. And uh, we just can't say thank you enough. And we honor you tonight. And what a blessing. And we just love you guys so much. And to Pastor Josh and Brittany, uh, man, we're your biggest fans. You know what I love about your new pastors is that we've got a lot of time to hang out with them. And every single time we're hanging out with them, I see a pastor that is even more character-driven when he's one-on-one. Wait, all he's talking about is you guys and the church and his love. And I'm trying to talk about how awesome the Redskins are, even when we suck. And he's like, no, 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 the church. It's the church. It's the church. And I'm like, no, 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 but the Redskins. He's like, no, it's the church. And these people need Jesus. And every single time, and man, I just... There's, so, there's such a passion with them, and I've got, he comes and speaks at our church every single time, and I had to limit that because they keep on wanting him back, and I'm like, no, he's, no, he's, he's a pastor somewhere else, not in Richmond. You don't care. They're like, no, bring him back. No, 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 we can't. Um, but, uh, man, we're, we're your biggest fans, and we love you guys dearly, and I just believe with all of our heart, um, we're rallying. You're our church family, and we just believe again, no eye has seen. Come on, and no ear has heard. You thought it was great in the first generation, and it was. And Pastor David, they're standing on your shoulders. But I'm telling you right now, in the name of Jesus, Satan better watch out because this church is on the move. It's rising. It's going forward. And God's best, come on, is yet to come in your life. Come on, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against what this church is going to do with these leaders. In the name of Jesus, come on. Stretch out your hands and lift your voice with me. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, and we bless, Lord, them in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we pray for Pastor Josh, Lord, and Brittany. Lord, we speak and we bind every attack of the enemy, Lord, off of this family, Lord, off of their children, Lord, and off of this church. Lord, oh God, weapons may come, but they will not prosper in Jesus' name. Lord, we speak a fresh anointing, fresh fire, fresh vision. Holy Spirit, would you show them? Would you continue to change them? And would you continue to fill them with your power and with your spirit? Lord, they're going to work like it depends on them and pray like it depends on you. Lord, to you be glory forever and ever for generation and generation unto you be all glory and honor. Come on, and everybody said amen and amen. Now, before the kids leave, um, you stay standing for just a minute. Uh, we've got two presentations. One is for Rayleigh, and one is for the three boys. So if you just bring both of them on out here. Um, I'm going to start. I'll take this one, and I'm going to let Joanne read this prayer to Rayleigh. Is this uh... <laughs> actually, Josh? You want to hold that for her? Yeah. Yeah. And Rayleigh, this is for you. I don't know who will be the first female pastor of the Life Church, Rayleigh or Lala, but they'll fight for it. I can promise you. <laughs> You're. <laughs> You're going to get a glimpse in the lobby uh, 20-some years ago. I'm not going to cry. Um, I presented David with a picture of my three boys and a prayer, General Douglas MacArthur's prayer. And um, so today, we're going to pray over their children, 
And uh, we're going to put these in the lobby so you can see my three boys and then see them and, and the prayers there. But if you would join with me, we're going to pray over Rayleigh. Lord, let Rayleigh learn early in life that to obey you, God, is the best way to the life her heart truly desires. May she find comfort in your ability, God, to reach her, hold her, and rescue her. Let her find confidence in you even when hard times come and she doesn't know what to do by keeping her eyes fixed on you. May she keep herself under control and not give full vent to people and situations that anger her. Let her walk in the security of your assigned worth to her. Give her a strong work ethic and health to accomplish all her tasks. Give her a heart that desires to extend her hand to those in need. Protect her for the right husband, a man of respect and godly honor. And let her be a woman of joy and laughter, whose Christ-centered character is what makes her most beautiful. In Jesus' name, amen. over the three boys. And then this last one is uh, the three boys, Roman, Judah, and Israel. How you doing, Israel? How you doing? And actually, this is the same prayer from uh, General MacArthur that um, was given to us to pray over Josh, Jordan, and Justin. So I'm going to let Josh, act. this is a father's prayer to his boys. I'm going to ask him to pray this prayer. Build me a son, O Lord, who will be strong enough to know when he is weak, brave enough to face himself when he is afraid, one who will be proud and unbending in honest defeat, and humble and gentle in victory. Build me a son whose wishes will not take the place of deeds, a son who will know thee, and that to know himself is the foundation stone of knowledge. Lead him, I pray, not in the path of ease and comfort, but under the stress and spur of difficulties and challenge. Here let him learn to stand up in the storm. Here let him learn compassion for those who fail. Build me a son whose heart will be clear, whose goal will be high, a son who will master himself before he seeks to master other men, one who will reach into the future yet never forget the past. And after all these things are his, add, I pray, enough of sense of humor so that he may always be serious yet never take himself too seriously. Give him humility so that he may always remember the simplicity of true greatness, the open mind of true wisdom, and the meekness of true strength. Then I, his father, will dare to whisper, I have not lived in vain. Amen. So, ladies and gentlemen, before you're seated, I get the high honor of presenting to you for the first time the senior pastors of the Life Church, Josh and Brittany Bain. Thank you, everybody. Um, before you're seated, you want to say something? I feel like we just got married again. <laughs> Should we kiss? I'm just kidding. No, seriously, I really do feel like we just got married again because it's this <laughs> surreal feeling. And I remember the day we got married, I guess, a decade ago, right? Almost. Yeah, and um, it was similar, being presented before a large group of people like this. And those of you that um, are married, you probably remember that moment when you are pronounced husband and wife. And it's such a, it's a surreal feeling because it's such a humbling feeling because you're realizing you have just entered into a role that you have never been in before. 
Um, and so that's kind of the way I feel right now. I, I'm sure you feel that way too. It's very humbling, um, but at the same time, uh, it's, it's, I feel very sure. And it's for the same reason you feel that way when you're presented as husband and wife, and it's because of the commitment. You, you can't predict the future. You don't know what life is about to throw at you, but you do know that you are committed to one another. So mm -hmm. we don't stand here as experts. Obviously, we're five seconds into this thing. <laughs> um, uh, but we do stand here committed. Yeah. Um, so we are very humbled, but very sure and completely committed. All that we are to you guys. You may kiss your bride. I want you to stay standing real quick. I'm going to read a passage, and I'm going to speak for a couple minutes, I promise, not a long time. Um, but uh, I want to read from Joshua chapter 1. It was, it was referred to, actually, in the, in the videos. Um, I think it was Pastor Ron that referred to this. But I want to just read this and, and then just comment on it as kind of the, this begin, this kind of inaugural speech, I guess, tonight, um, what God has put on my heart for the future and it's from Joshua chapter 1, verse 1, and it's the first 11 verses, and it says, After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, thank God my dad's not dead, he's right over there still, um, <laughs> the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, and he said, Moses, my servant is dead, therefore the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land I am giving them. And it says, I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set foot, you will be on land I have given you, from the Negev wilderness in the south to the Lebanon mountains in the, in the north, from the Euphrates River in the east to the Mediterranean Sea in the west, including all the land of the Hittites. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live, for I will be with you as I was with Moses. It says, for I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. So be strong and courageous, for you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors I would give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or the left. Then you'll be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night, so you'll be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. But Joshua then commanded the officers of Israel, go through the camp and tell the people to get their provisions ready, for in three days you will cross the Jordan River and take possession of the land the Lord your God has given you. You can sit down real quick. Um, God put this passage on my heart real clear when my dad said, I want you to, after, after we install you, just share with the church just for a couple minutes, and I knew it was from this iconic passage in the Bible. Before I do this, I do need to set the record straight. On January 6th, my dad announced this transition was going to happen, and he used the analogy, the illustration of a, a, a relay race and track, and he was talking about how I ran relays in, in high school and how we were really good and I was really fast, especially for a white guy, he said, and, and, and then he said he ran a 4040, and like most of the room didn't do anything, but some of the people who know how fast a 40 is were like, What? A 4.040. I just want to go on record tonight on my first night and just make sure that the record is straight. <laughs> that if I ran a 4.040, I wouldn't be here. I'd be training for the Olympics because I'd be the fastest man in history. <laughs> what he meant to say was that I ran a 4.40, which is still pretty fast. But, um, but I did run, did run relay, for the 4x1 uh, relay in high school. And um, I'll never forget, I was the second leg of that relay, and, and we did good. We went, to we went to the state finals, and I'll never forget the feeling that I had running that relay where I'm standing 100 meters into the race, and I see, hear the gun go off, and I see Jared, my, my first leg teammate, uh, take off, and he's sprinting as fast as he can. He starts to get close to me, 
And we enter the, he starts to get close to the exchange zone, and I take off running as fast as I can. And eventually, right when the exchange zone hits, we're both running the same speed. And I remember the feeling of adrenaline where I'm running top speed and I'm about to get the baton. And just this feeling that everybody's watching, everybody's cheering, and it hasn't been me, but now it's like all eyes are about to be on me. I'm running full speed and my hand's back, and he gives me the baton, and now it's the moment. And I just remember the feeling of being like full of adrenaline. It's pumping, like it's almost like an out-of-body experience as I'm running at top speed. And I ran the 100-meter the dash, I ran the 200, and I ran the 400-meter dash, which is how long this race was, except there was four of us running 100 meters each. I ran all those races myself, but I never had as much adrenaline. I never took any of them as serious as I took the relay, because as I was running with the baton, I, the baton, I was holding something that wasn't mine. I was holding something that, yeah, it was mine, because it was my leg. It was my part of the race. It was my moment. And yeah, everybody was looking at me right now, but I was holding it because, and I was holding it thinking, I can't mess up what Jared did, and I can't put Ryan Williams in a bad position, so I got to run this thing the best that I possibly can because this thing is way bigger than me. I, was, I run with this baton going, this is my part of the race, but it's not my baton. Like, this is my part of the race, and it's my job right now, and yeah, all eyes are on me right now, but this thing is bigger than me, and I ran faster in the four by one than I ran the 100 by myself, because I didn't want to mess it up for the person who handed it to me. I didn't want to put the person in front of me in a bad position. The race was bigger than me, and, and I, as I'm leading up to tonight, and tonight I feel like this, as Brittany said, it's this humbling feeling of like, it's like, this is way bigger than me. This is awesome, and I'm going to run my race. And I, I said it heart to heart. Some of you are at the heart to heart night where I shared kind of for the first time since the transition was announced. And I said, oh, I'm confident. Don't worry. But I'm so humble because I didn't, I wasn't leading in the first 100 meters. The race is bigger than me. And I know that the world doesn't revolve around me. And one day, the race will go beyond me. But you know what? It makes me run better, and it makes me run faster, and it makes me run more focused because I realize what I'm a part of is bigger than me. And so I have that feeling tonight. I love it. when If you, if you look up, just like, you're not going to do it, so I'll just tell you. But, but if you look up track and look up all the world records and stuff, you'll notice that that the, the 400 meter dash world record is significantly slower than the four by 100 meter relay world record. You catch, catch what I'm saying? There's, there's a record for the 400 meter dash where one guy or girl runs around the track once. And the world record is significantly slower than the time of the four by 100 meter relay. They're running the same distance, but it, listen, it's four people that are all running full speed. I think, you know, we, we use sports analogies. I grew up playing sports, and Pastor Wally even mentioned sports. I think this analogy, this illustration represents the generational blessing and the power of generation to generation in the Bible is that you might be running 400 meters, but you can run faster when you run together. You can run faster when you know that it's time to pass the baton because this guy in front of me, he has fresh energy. He has fresh vision. I've already been running 100 meters, and he's going to take this thing faster in the second 100 than I could run in my own second 100. And that's how I feel. I'm standing on the shoulders of, of people who've given their lives, who have brought broken through barriers and broken through challenges, and I've grown up. I didn't always know how big of a deal it was. I grew up, and they were copying bulletins on the Xerox machine, and I was playing with crazy glue in the church office and making paper clip chains and making it real long on Sellyfield Circle and playing hide-and-seek under the stage, and I didn't know the significance of what they were doing. I was watching as a kid, but they were breaking barriers. They were breaking molds of the ways people did church. They were, they were having to face the church planting demons that I'll never have to face, Josh and Crystal. They were lifting the ceiling of expectation. My kids get to grow up, and multi-campus church is normal. My kids woke up this morning. They said, where are we going today? He said, Warrenton Campus. 
Do you understand the significance of that? That my little children get to grow up where it's normal to have thousands of people. I grew up, it was normal to have hundreds. They grow up, it's normal to have thousands. I pray that their children grow up and it's normal to have tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands because we stand on the shoulders of the people who have laid the foundation and gone before us. I'd never be able to run that second 100 as fast if I had to run the first. I'm standing on the shoulders of not only my mom and dad, but a a whole generation that has been faithful and that is still here. And that's part of the humbling part and the honoring part is I pray to lead a bunch of people who are older than me. I'm 31. (laughs) I'm really, I'm leading a ton of people who are older than I am. But I pray that I lead you understanding that you have a giant, massive role in the kingdom still until the day you breathe your last breath. And I hope that I'm a better leader because I have my ears open and my heart open and places open in this body for the people that have gone before me that are more seasoned and more mature and more experienced to be able to make this place and make this family better than we would be if we were just a bunch of young people who didn't care about legacy. And I just want to say, as I close, I I just want to say, it's dangerous. I got my dad's Bible, his preaching Bible, because I might just preach. It's over now. Y'all might as well not put that clock up. I'm just, I'll preach however long I want every time I preach. I got my dad's Bible. Got my dad's anointing. But as I read Joshua because... I just, I was reading it, it's so familiar, sometimes you freak, you don't notice things in passages when they're so familiar to you, and I just, I love a couple things about it that I'll leave you with. The first one is, I promise you what I promised Moses. It wasn't Joshua's promise, and in fact, it wasn't even Moses' promise, it was God's promise. It's God's promise. Guess what? This is God's story, and I know tonight is, is about my parents, and they're passing it to me, and and I, like, I'm honored that you came and stuff, and thank you so much for coming because this is special. But my instinct is to be like, all right, stop looking at me now. Like, this is making me uncomfortable because this is God's story that we get to be a part of. This is not about me. This is not about my parents. This is about the promise of God. And it might have started with Moses and Joshua, kept it going, but it didn't finish with Joshua. Come on. This thing is bigger than us. I promise you what I promised Moses. It's bigger than you, Joshua. It's bigger than Moses. Joshua, you don't have to take him out of Egypt. Moses did that. But you're going to take him into the promised land. I don't know if Joshua could have taken him out of Egypt. I don't know. But he didn't have to. He got to stand on the shoulders of greatness. And so I want to let you know that, that my parents and all the leaders that surround him, they've brought us this far. But they didn't bring us this far just to keep us here. We got some of the old timers over here in the front, and I know they remember Miss Helen. I don't even know if Miss Helen is here, but she wrote this song like, y'all don't know old school church. Old school church is if somebody wrote a song and they had it, you just come up and sing it. You wrote a song, Miss Helen, come up and sing it today. You can't do that. You try to walk up onto the stage and grab a mic, you're gonna get tackled, okay? Now, back then, Miss Helen, she just walked on the stage with her guitar and she used to sing, he did not bring us out this far to bring us back again. He brought us out to take us into the promised land. He didn't take you out of Egypt to leave you in the wilderness, everybody. My dad and my mom and this generation has brought us from zero to thousands, but it will not stay thousands. God has called me and my wife and these leaders in this church to go from thousands to tens of thousands. And we will not stop until we see the promise of God fulfilled. And so if you think we're running fast now, buckle your seatbelt, because I close with this. Joshua says in verse 10, Joshua steps up after God's talked to him and said, you're the person, be strong and courageous. And he steps up and he And he tells the the officers, he says, I want you to go through the camp, and I want you to tell people, get your stuff ready. Because in three days, we're crossing over into the land that God has given us. 
And I know I said it at heart to heart, but I'm going to say it again tonight, that, that y'all better get your stuff ready, because the time is coming where we're moving into the land that God has given us. Thank you that he's brought us this far, but he didn't bring us this far to leave us here. Get your stuff ready, because we're moving in to the promises of God. When the promises of God are from generation to generation. The promises of God don't stop. The promises of God don't stagnate. God has given us a word. He's given us a promise. He's given us a vision. And the vision is for a community. And until everybody's saved in this community, there's more work to do. And you might say, well, the auditorium is full. Well, let's buy a new auditorium. You might say, well, we already got three campuses. Well, let's plant some more campuses. We're not going to stop until our community is saved or until Jesus comes back. But I don't think Jesus is coming back anytime soon. That's what your new senior pastor thinks. So we got work to do. So I, I want to finish. You can stay standing with this. I sh- Shared this a couple weeks ago, but I want to share it again tonight because I feel like God has put new verbiage and and a new fresh uh, vision statement on what has been going on here for a long time. And so as I step into this role, God put this on my heart. Actually, God put this on my heart. Like, I started writing this probably eight months ago just for the future time before I ever knew it would be January 19 right now. And it was like God was putting words to what was deep down in my heart. And it's not my vision. Again, it's God's vision, which if it's God's vision for us, that means it's also your vision for this house. And so I don't want you to read my vision. I want you to read God's vision for us. And so I'm going to read you God's vision for us. And it goes like this. Let's dream together of a church that is so dynamic that the city can't ignore it. A church with a culture so strong that the community is shaped by it. A church with a love so deep that even the skeptic is drawn to it. Let's dream together of a church that will go to extraordinary lengths to reconcile our world to Jesus. A church that will accept everyone, always. A church that will serve people, love people, and lead people. Let's dream together of a church that will grow in numbers, maturity, and influence. A church that is as diverse as its community. A church that is generationally minded, where the spiritually seasoned are actively involved and the youth are fully engaged. A church that will generously and intentionally leverage resources to serve those in need at home and across the world. Let's dream it so we can become it. The best is ahead. Come on, somebody. This is the vision. We have to envision it, we have to dream it, so that we can do it, so that we can become it. This is the vision. They say the greatest athletes, they visualize championships before they win them. Phelps would envision that race before he would swim it. Tom Brady, greatest of all time, envisions his Super Bowl before he gets there. And it's crazy about Tom Brady, who's playing next week, is when he loses before the Super Bowl, his training continues as if the Super Bowl, as if he was in it. Before he changes his, to his off-season regime, he waits until after the Super Bowl has been played so that he stays in championship mode. I'm telling you, tonight, it doesn't matter what comes your way in your life, you have to stay in championship mode. Not because it's about you, but because God's purpose for your life is too great and too significant for you to get sidetracked and discouraged by some mountains, because my Bible says that my God moves mountains. And so you got to keep your eyes on the Super Bowl. You have to keep your eyes on championship. What does that mean? We got to keep our eyes on the community. We got to keep our eyes on the promise. We got to keep our eyes on the things of God, for the promises of God never fail. His promise still stands. And you might say, well, what about this and this and this in my life? Well, you're breathing, aren't you? You're here, aren't you? This is proof that he's never failed me yet, and he's not going to start now. And so we're going to step into our future with courage and confidence and boldness. We're going to envision that. Until we become that, we're not going to stop.
And that's going to take a lifetime. So buckle up and get your provisions ready because we are moving out now into the land that God has given to us. Can we lift our hands in prayer? Can we lift our hands? I believe that I believe that God wants to do in you all the time that God wants to do in you individually, in your family, what he's doing corporately. I believe that God works in our church. He works in the gathering. He works in the ecclesia, the large gathering of believers so that it can be mirrored in the homes. What he is doing in this house, I believe he wants to do in your house, in your family, and in your life. Come on, you're lifting your hands. If, if you need a new season, if you need a new level of a anointing, a new level of influence. Come on, if you need more vision for your life and for your family, if you need God to come through, come on, grab a hold of this anointing tonight. Grab a hold of what God is doing in us corporately and say, I'm going to step into the promised land in my own life. As we're doing it as a church, I'm going to step into it in my own life. God, I pray for us. Pray for every person here and every family that's represented and all of the influence that this room represents with all of the connections and relationships. And I just pray that you would move us into everything that you have for us. We move ahead humbly, of course, knowing that it's not about us, but we move ahead confidently because we know it's not up to us. It's up to you, and it's in your hands, and we're going to work hard and do everything that we can in the natural, but God, we need you to pour out the supernatural. Holy Spirit, we pray for a fresh wind. We pray for a fresh fire. We pray for the fresh anointing, God, that comes from heaven to fall, and may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Do you receive that tonight for yourself? Do you receive it tonight for our church? I want to, um, we're going to close here in a minute, but just, just two more things that we're going to do. Um, you can go ahead and grab your seat, and we're going to hear uh, from somebody that's special to us and that has... Uh, prayed over Brittany and I in this church and my parents. And after that, we're going to sing a final song, do it again. And so I encourage you to stay and let's, let's worship out of this place tonight. And I believe God is doing extraordinary things. The best is ahead. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Everybody, God bless you. Hello, Life Church. Very honored to be with you on this exciting weekend, installing your new pastors and all of us here at Lakewood just want to tell you how much we love you. We love your founding pastors. And, you know, I, I think back in my own life because, you know, guys, I was where you were because I took over for my parents when, when my dad passed. But uh, I look back, you know, my dad and mom served 40 years. I know you guys have served 20, but I wouldn't be, you know, near where I am today without such faithful people like, like you all. So we, we certainly honor Pastor David and Joanne and just all the, the years you guys have served and just the, the amazing things you've done. Even being with you in your services not long ago, uh, just an amazing place. But you know what, it, it is an exciting time because I believe, you know, from generation to generation, we're supposed to go higher. We're supposed to take new ground. And so I know that's what pastors... Josh and Brittany are going to do and so I know you're behind them as well so I just encourage you to you know be planted in the house of the Lord know that these guys love you they want to see you become all God's created you to be and even as we stand in this auditorium you know never dreamed we would be here the former compact center you know I was yeah. behind the scenes all that time but I just say that to say you don't know where God's going to take you Lakewood started with 90 people and you know now we're a lot bigger than that but you know, I just, again, just um, be excited. Here's what I have in my spirit for 2019. God's going to help you take new ground, set new standards, and step into new levels. So I believe that for you and over your, your new pastors as well. So I'm honored to be here. I'd just love to pray a prayer of blessing over pastors Josh and Brittany. So, Lord, we know this is ordained by you. It's not happening by accident. So, Lord, I just speak life and favor and hope and faith and victory into this couple. Lord, I thank you that you're increasing their anointing. Lord, that they will rise up to new levels, that they will supersede even what their parents have done. So Lord, I just thank you for guiding them, filling them with wisdom, 
Lord, I thank you for drawing more people all over the area. Lord, just from the north, the south, the east, and the west. And Lord, like you've shown Lakewood favor and caused us to, to rise further than we ever dreamed. I ask, Lord, that you do it yes. for Josh and Brittany yes. And, yes. and Life Church there. Lord, we thank you that you're a big God, that you're in control. So we speak blessings over this couple. And we just thank you, Lord, from generation to generation, you are faithful. We believe it. We declare favor and blessings in Jesus' name. So we love you very much. It's a new day and we're honored to be with you. So congratulations, guys. We love Thank you. you. So much.